Welcome back ladies and gentlemen to another episode of Meta. This time we're going to be tackling the beast that is statistics. Now, why why should we bother with statistics? What's the point of us doing statistics, right? It just seems like a very boring dry topic. And the thing is statistics is about accuracy, right? Our goal is to be accurate and the opposite of accuracy is inaccuracy. And inaccuracy is actually one of the biggest problems we've had as humans, right? We've historically misattributed everything from the storms to the rains to everything we've always said we've always blamed the wrong thing or the wrong person and that's a problem right because when you blame the wrong thing it's fine but when you're blaming the wrong people then people get ostracized they get alienated um they get separated from the community so it's important for us to point the right fingers at the right people and the right objects when something goes right or when something goes wrong right so statistics and and you know you know how this works right like the media today has just become so difficult the crazy amount of fake news out there if you don't have a handle or a grip on statistics you are just going to be swayed um like a, any other member of the crowd right so having the basic knowledge of statistics allows you to separate things because you know in the past you know there were claims saying that fat is bad and then after a few years um the claims changed and said no sugar is bad right so these studies and and for you to understand these studies you need to really put yourself in the psyche of a researcher unlike many other fields researchers don't get famous that easily right they they're relatively unknown nobody knows about a researcher who's writing a paper and the only way a researcher shoots to fame the only way a researcher gets promoted the only way a researcher gets known in the community is if he or she puts out something spectacular right some finds out something awesome but the truth about science is that not everything you do research on is awesome so a lot of the experiments that this researcher would do would fail and most people don't like that failure because it, look it's it's your it's your career on the line so a lot of data especially in science is fudged it's a lot of you know questionable statistical methods that are used which is why even today science is still an evolving field because we don't have the discipline or rather we don't have the knowledge of applying solid statistics to our research data so this is about this course here is about how do we take data how do we arrange it and how do we try to in an unbiased fashion uh, come up with come up with something come up with associations and not just you know weak associations but strong associations and the crux of the matter is did a cause b or did a and b just happen randomly along with each other that's the bane of statistics right that's what we're trying to figure out and let's get right to the course All right so basics of statistics um is the first episode humans often draw rubbish conclusions from data for many many centuries we misattributed the associations between and causes for everything from floods to diseases to weight gain right we needed a formalized way to work with data the study of statistics is a way to process and extract information from data so we can draw conclusions from data that are really true and not just what we prefer to be true So this part statistics is about it's a quest for the truth regardless of what industry you're doing it in you could be you know applying statistical methods to medicine you could be applying statistical methods to i don't know physics right it doesn't matter what industry or or what field you're applying it to at the end of the day it's a quest for the truth and the truth in itself like finding the truth in itself is something that most humans eventually become committed to or most humans completely abandon right so it's it's You know the search for truth is something that that's special to me because since I work in many different fields I see a lot of you know data just being cherry picked you know people just misusing uh the field of science so I want this I I I personally have a vested interest in the truth and so should you because it's awesome to know the truth and most importantly it's when you figure out the truth about something you can apply it right when you actually figure out okay this is how this is formed we can do everything from figuring out um how to make silicon transistors how, how to convert silicon into transistors how to create mobile phones how to create computers how to create the internet when you figure out the truth you can apply it so a couple of quotes here's a quote by charles darwin that i really like it's in his book the descent of man false facts are highly injurious to the progress of science for they often long endure right which is you put out a false fact it stays forever like until somebody else comes in and you know says this is not true but false views if supported by some evidence do little harm as everyone takes a salutary pleasure in proving their falseness 
And when this is done, one path towards error is closed and the road to truth is often at the same time open. So, so I want to tell you a little story, right? Um, which, which talks about how poor science or poor statistics can actually cause a lot of damage. In the 1900s, stomach ulcers were a very common phenomenon, right? More than 10% of the population had stomach ulcers. And most elite doctors and medical scientists said, look, stomach ulcers are caused by stress. And there was actually very, very little evidence to back this, right? There was one old research paper that said, yes, stress and stomach ulcers are kind of related. So every patient that came in with stomach ulcers, the doctor would just say, look, this is stress, take some anti-anxiety pills, you'll be fine. And the patients never got fine. They just never went back to the doctor because they never got cured. And many people had to have their stomachs removed. People were bleeding. And still doctors kept saying, no, it's stress. It's stress. Until in the 1980s, there was a doctor named Barry Marshall. He's actually a scientist. And he said, hey, guys, I've been doing some research on stomach ulcers. And, you know, I found this very strong correlation between this bacterium called Helicobacter pylori. That's Helicobacter pylori. And he said, look, I think it's this bacterium that's causing or this bacteria that's causing issues, right? And this is the one, this, this is the bacteria that's behind stomach ulcers. And other doctors just shunned him. They said, you know, look at this old research paper. You are wrong. Um, you don't go against the medical community, right? And this guy, he came out and said, but, but look, but, you know, this is, here's proof. And they said, no, 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 get us more proof, right? And the thing about this bacterium, Helicobacter pylori, does not infect rats. It only infects primates and above. So he had to test on either primates or humans and he couldn't get his hands on primates. So this guy, just to prove his point, he went and swallowed an entire bottle of Helicobacter pylori and almost died of ulcers, right? So this man, he said, look, we have some science that's poor um, and I have data about it. Nobody's listening to me. So watch me do it. And that is when the medical community took note and then they said, oh, you know, I think stomach ulcers are caused by Helicobacter pylori, right? So it took one man going very, very far, almost killing himself to prove that some old science was bad. And that's what this quote says, right? If there's a false fact in science, that fact is just carried on forever because nobody questions it. It's very hard for scientists to question each other, right? They question other things, but when it comes to an established scientist who's put out something, other scientists rarely challenge him. When... I'm chat or we are challenging the educational system. It's such an established thing, the educational system. And for us to come in and question it and say, Hey, I don't think this works the way it's meant to work. I think, you know, education should be fairly free. Um, at least the basics. When we came out and put out all that for the first time many years ago, we got attacked by the same elitist, right? The same guy who said, no, this has been around forever. Why are you challenging this? So statistics is important. And if we didn't have the statistics behind us, if we couldn't prove that, look, most engineering colleges in India are producing candidates or producing aspirants who are not going anywhere, who are not getting jobs. If there wasn't a 94, 95% unemployability in the country, we wouldn't have enough solid data to prove this, right? So in fact, even when we do this, we need to show our statistics and show that, hey, we're doing better than a regular college and for a fraction of the price. So politicians use statistics the same way that a drunk uses lampposts for support rather than illumination. So a lot of stats that are being used today, they're just cherry picked and, you know, you're just leaning on them. There's this statistic going around that 80% of statistics are false in the first place. So if you don't know how to use this, or if you don't know how to understand and read a research paper or understand statistics and the different concepts around it, you will simply be subjected to the false views of another person. So, or another group. So, you know, this arm yourself with with, I think, in my opinion, one of the strongest weapons against false news, against false research, right? So statistics is a great weapon to have in your arsenal. So let's get right to the meat of it, right? The first key term we need to talk about in when it comes to statistics is the idea of data and its individual component, datum. So you have a lot of data and then each individual piece is called a datum. And we look at all the others in the next few slides. So population and sample size. You see, Sometimes you can't go out and study everyone. If you want to know the percentage of the population that has, say, cancer, you can't literally go and survey every single person or every single human. So what we realized a long, long time ago is that suppose you want to survey every human being. We know that's not physically possible. We can actually survey a small portion of them, a sizable portion of them, 
And then we can say that whatever applies to this sizable portion also applies to the larger population, right? So a population is a set of all the people that you can possibly test. So if you want to test, say, all the women in the world, that's your population. But your sample could be all the women in, say, Bangalore, India, right? So a sample is a smaller subset of a population. So a sample is a fuzzy photograph of a clear photograph that is the whole population. So you have a clear photograph and we're kind of, when we zoom into a smaller population, we'll see the idea of this, this photographs in, you know, in a future episode of this. Um, as the sample size increases in size, it approaches the population. So if I'm studying only the women in Bangalore, India, and I want to study all the women, then as I add more and more and more cities, as I add more and more countries, I eventually approach the, you know, population or the entirety of all the women that I want to study. So there are two ways you can do sampling. There are many ways you can do sampling, but I'm going to talk about two. The first one is random sampling. So if I want to study, say, all the cancer patients in the world, I can go to any particular hospital and I can pick out a random sample. I can say, hey, I want 50 people who have cancer from this hospital. I'm going to give them surveys. So that's a random sample. You just randomly do it. Then there's something called stratified sampling, right? So I can actually say, look, I want to study all the cancer patients in the world and I can't do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide them into different subgroups. I'm going to get some men who have cancer, some women who have cancer, and then maybe some children who have cancer. Now, there is an overlap between the men who have cancer and the children who have cancer because there are some children who can be male. So stratified sampling basically means I split my sample size into subgroups, right? And then I say I put all the subgroups together and that's my sample. Right. So the next thing you need to understand is a parameter and statistic. A parameter is a value that describes the entire population. Right. For example, the percentage of people who eat vegetarian food in India. Right. A statistic is a value that describes the sample size. So, for example, the percentage of people who eat vegetarian food in your current study, which is taking place, suppose, in a school in India. Right. And you can name that school, say Don Bosco School in India. Right. So um, parameter is something that applies to the whole population statistic is something that applies to your sample size right so whatever the statistic we get say we know that 10 percent of people uh, like veg food um, and that's your statistic maybe the parameter could be 15 percent right and what we try to do and as the sample size gets bigger the statistic and the parameter become one and the same right so at the maximum when at the maximum sample size which is the population the statistic and the parameter are one and the same so the quest for statistical significance. Whenever you do a study or a trial, a lot of the results depend on random chance or random factors. Statistical significance means that some effect is unlikely to have happened by random chance. So I'll give you an example of this, right? Um, there is a reason we do something called placebo control studies in medicine, right? So there was this idea that if you give somebody a medicine and they get better, that means the medicine works, right? That means that, hey, this person is taking the medicine and now this person has become better and medicine works. But then we started understanding that, you know, even if you don't give somebody a medicine, right? Even if you're just saying, you know, here's some healing or whatever, the person still gets better. And that's because human beings, the human body has something called regression to the mean, right? We have an immune system. And if you fall sick or if you have an issue or if you break a bone, the human body has ways to mend itself back together. So you might recover in five days or 10 days. And what we started doing then is we started saying, look, while we give a particular medicine, say we're giving somebody antibiotics, let's also give this person another drug, maybe, you know, a placebo, right? Which doesn't have an active component. Maybe it's just sugar, right? And then let's see whether the antibiotic cures the person faster than the sugar pill. So statistical significance means by how much, right? Is this... Is this something that has just happened by regression of mean or random chance? Or is this something that has happened because of the medicine, right? And that's what we're trying to find out. Can we attribute the right things to the right things? Can we attribute a particular event to the right thing, right? So, and one more thing to understand is the difference between statistically significant and practically significant. Statistically significant means, hey, this is better in the lab. This works in the lab. But practically significant means that this also has real effects, right? So let's assume there's a drug called Regrow X that claims to regrow hair. Statistical significance means that it should work better than placebo for the people in the experiment. But I want to ask you a question, right? Say there's a bald person, 
right? And then he uses the drug Regrow X and he regrows some hair. Now, would you call this a cure, right? Because the person has regrown hair, but it's not too much, just a little bit. Now, what happens is most papers in the world, most research papers in the world, most media companies in the world, when they read a research paper like this without images, they go off, they go out and often say, we found a cure for baldness or we found a cure or we found a cure. And this is my biggest issue, right? Because this is statistically significant and that's awesome. It works. There's a little bit of efficacy, but is it a cure? And that's the problem that people have, right? They don't know when something is working by a little bit and something is a total solution, right? And we tend to confuse what's working by a little percentage with what's a total solution, right? In the next um, picture, you can see that this is practical significance. Practical significance refers to the magnitude of difference. This is also known as the effect size. Results are practically significant when the difference is large enough to be meaningful in real life, not just in the lab or on a piece of paper, not just 10% increment. And I'm talking about a proper full cure. Most studies, studies, while statistically significant, are not practically significant, right? And this, there's an important implication to this. A lot of things out there that are considered cures or considered efficient for something, whether it could be medicine or Ayurveda or whatever, a lot of that research data is just statistically significant and that, that too not by a large effect size, right? And there are things that have large effect sizes. So I'll give you the example of paracetamol, right? If you look at any research study about the association between paracetamol, the drug in, or the active ingredient in crocin, and say um, its efficacy for headache, you'll see that the results are not just statistically significant, they're also very practically significant. Same with antibiotics for antibiotic responsive diseases, like say a bacterium induced cold, right? So these are not just simple statistical significance, right? these are practically significant too. So knowing the difference, knowing how to read a research paper, these are all very, very important things. And hopefully we will learn it across this course so you become armed with that knowledge. So the data analytics process, you can call it analytics, you can call it analytics, it doesn't matter. But the process is very simple. First, you formulate the research problem. Then you define the population, you know, the total set of people that you want to kind of absorb and then the sample how many of them you're actually able to reach out to and give the survey to then you collect and clean data and we'll teach you how to do that right then you do something called descriptive data analysis and we'll we'll come to all of this in a bit in the next episode use the best statistical methods to solve the problem different problems have different methods that we can apply and we learn some of those methods and then finally you report the results you say look i've done all this i've done the cleaning I've done descriptive data analysis. I've used the best statistical method. Here's my result, right? And your result is, is this statistically significant and by how much, right? So we learn a lot about this. You know, when we're in the basics course, we're not going to go through all the different analytics processes. We're not going to go through all the different statistical methods, but we're going to go through enough. So you have a decent understanding. So you're able to use that as a crutch to learn more about data science. All right. So catch you on the next episode.